and we are recording. And I'm really happy to have with me today Dr. Georgia Eid, who's a psychiatrist focused on the connection between nutrition, metabolism, and mental health. Welcome on, Georgia. Thank you very much, Ali. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> um, around about the start of 2016, when I um, I, I really took the, the comments of my old uh, PhD supervisor seriously. You know, he would he would drop he would say strange things like, um, "Margarine isn't really food," or "I only eat once a day," and fat is saturated fat is good for you and stuff like that. And I and I couldn't ignore that from, you know, a physicist um, who appeared to be in the picture of health especially one who'd recovered from chronic fatigue syndrome. And one of the first places that I found online that really breathed life into these ideas was your website, diagnosisdiet.com. Hmm. And um, I really appreciate you being there at that time for uh, to sort of uh, bolster my confidence in doing that. And changing my diet and um you know I, I wonder if you can tell us your story a little bit about why you started that website and how you got to where you are now well i'm i'm so glad it helped you uh i didn't know you back then and so uh i i started the website in in 2012 and it really began as a way for me to explore some of these ideas that I was um, learning about and curious about in nutrition because I, I was was and still am a psychiatrist and and had a newfound interest in nutrition. So I was reading nutrition science papers for the first time and really trying to understand, really trying to get to the bottom of some of these uh questions and controversies about nutrition that had always confused me. And, and so I thought as a means of sharing, sharing that process with other people in case other people might learn something from it and to engage with the public about it, um, that I would, that I would do so publicly on, on this, on this website. So, <clears throat> and it's evolved over time into really more of a focus on nutrition and mental health, but, but in the early years, it really was focused on really any any question about food and health, physical and mental health that crossed my mind that I was interested in. So, and the reason I was doing that or, or what led me to become curious about these things was that I had resolved a number of my own mysterious health problems by turning my diet kind of experimentally upside down. And, and in so doing, um, came across a lot of questions. So for example, you know, I had a lot of health issues that came that, that I was running into in my early forties, despite running and going to the gym and, and, you know, eating a sort of low fat, high fiber diet. Um, I, I really thought I was taking the best care of myself that I could. And despite that, I was feeling worse as I got older. And so I started experimenting with my diet and through a process of trial and error, because I didn't want to take medication and nobody really could find anything wrong with me. I'd gone through all kinds of tests, lots and lots of tests. I was working at Harvard at the time, had access to lots of Harvard specialists and smart and caring doctors, but really nobody could find anything wrong. But I knew something was wrong. So I, I just started experimenting with my diet and arrived by trial and error at a diet that was really upside down from how we're taught to eat. So it was a lot of animal protein, animal fat. It was lower in fiber. Um, it had uh, a very, very little carbohydrate in it. And, and it, you know, so, so this was this high fat, high animal protein, low fiber diet. That's the diet that healed me of all these different things or IBS and chronic fatigue and migraines and fibromyalgia and what have you. So, but the interesting thing was, I wasn't trying to improve my mental health. Um, I, I didn't think there was anything particularly off about my mental health. I had garden variety, depression and anxiety, you know, a little depression in the winter, anxiety you know, before 
you know, I had to do certain things in life, but not really anything to write home about. And, but my mental health improved really noticeably. And I thought to myself, well, this diet seems to be good for the brain. So why would that be? And, and the reason why I started reading all these nutrition papers was because I was honestly worried that the diet that I had arrived at was going to kill me because it was so high in, you know, cholesterol and animal fat and what didn't have very many plants in it at the time. And so that was my kind of quest. I, I wanted to understand what the truth was about nutrition and what I discovered, first of all, and didn't take that long. So anybody paying any attention to, you just scratch the surface of these nutrition science papers and you realize there's no there there. But, but really what I, what I was so surprised to find out was that almost everything I thought I knew about nutrition was wrong. It was, it was remarkable. I mean, almost everything. And that really got me interested in finding out well, A, what was what was the truth? And B, why? Why is the information we have so wrong? Um, and so so that's what that's what that was all about. And now I I really focus most of my most of my energy on the the relationship between nutrition, metabolism, and mental health, as you said. Um, so now I'm much more focused than I was in the beginning, but in the beginning I felt like I had so many questions. I, I felt I needed to go down different types of avenues to, to fill in all those blanks in my knowledge. So I'm really glad I did it that way uh, because I feel like I have a, a the bigger picture in mind when I'm thinking about the brain. Yeah. Um, you talked about scratching the surface and discovering that, you know, you you can read the literature, the established literature from hard scientists and easily back up the notion that a low carb, high fat diet is a good way forward for things like IDS, um, you know, um, certain other of the, the types of things that people struggle with chronically. Um, you know, of all the blog posts on diagnosis diet, for me, the ones about, you know, fiber and epidemiology were very powerful because fiber, that, the notion that you need fiber and more is better is is so uh, kind of baked in to our world that to say less fiber can be really good just sounds like, um, you know, you'll be smited <laughs> somehow any second. You, it's, you know, the reactions you get are of panic um, oftentimes. And the epidemiology thing, you know, that really makes the scales fall from your eyes because <laughs> the, um, you know, pretty much all of the health stories in in the in the press are based on epidemiology i mean maybe you could you could lightly touch on 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 fiber and epidemiology and what you know where you started from with those subjects and where you ended up yeah i i was trying to understand why we need fiber <laughs> so i mean so the first question was well th they say that this is really good for us and so I was trying to understand the mechanism. So why would it be good for us? Why are we supposed to have so much? And why? And when it seemed to me, when I was eating more fiber, I certainly had a lot more discomfort and did not feel well. And <clears throat> so the first question I always ask about any macronutrient or any type of food is, you know, well, do we need it at all? And and if so, why? And And so one of the things that I couldn't figure out by reading is I couldn't ever get to that level because the papers weren't, the papers seemed to make a lot of assumptions and then they went from there. They didn't start where I wanted to start, which was tell me what this, what this stuff is, how my body processes it and why it's good for me. And what happens if I don't have any, like, let's start with the basics. And 
none of the papers, uh, at least initially, when I was looking at the, you know, the, the, the most common type of paper about fiber was a, was usually pro fiber. It started with this assumption that fiber is good for you. And, and so many of the papers were, for example, papers about how to get people to eat more fiber. <laughs> and so that assumes that it's good for us and that more is better. But uh, what I started to understand as I was looking across different types of papers and asking different types of questions was that this was a, this was a problem I saw repeatedly. It, I saw that about fiber. I saw it about um, vegetables and fruits and vegetables. Um, I came across this problem when reading about, you know, why red meat is bad for you. It would start off with this assumption that it's bad for you. And, and then it would take, it would go from there. It never started at the beginning. And I really like to get to the bottom of things. So in any case, what it, what, what turned out to be the case was that these papers, the, the evidence, the evidence that all of these papers were based on, uh, uh, came from a type of nutrition study called a nutrition epidemiology study. And for any of your listeners who might be epidemiologists in other fields, don't worry, I'm not taking issue with the entire field of epidemiology. There, epidemiology can be a very useful uh, way to study things. Um, epidemiology is literally the study of epidemics. And it's very useful, for example, if you're studying a condition which has a single identifiable cause. So for example, the, the classic example and sort of the birth of epidemiology um, uh, uh, was uh, 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 attached to a physician named Dr. John Snow in, the, in, in London who was studying cholera. So cholera is caused by a single toxin. It's something you can, you know, you can, it has specific symptoms. There's only one cause of cholera. And it was, it was very easy to, to look at associations between whether people got cholera who were drinking from a particular contaminated water pump or whether they were living further away from that water pump. It was, these were associations, but they were very strong associations. So you could say, wow, most of the people who got cholera were living awfully close to this particular water pump. And, but you didn't just stop there with these really strong associations. You then just take the, you know, you take the, you convince the city officials to remove the handle of the pump so that people can't draw water from the pump anymore. And you see if the cholera goes away, you do an experiment to see if your hypothesis about cholera, about this well and cholera toxin and diseases in that neighborhood, you, you, you test your theory out to see if you're right or wrong. And they remove the handle and the cholera epidemic in that area, you know, ceased to be. So that's a good use of epidemiology. And what, it, what a, a really terrible use of epidemiology is to try to apply it to nutrition. And this has been done now for uh, at least since the 1950s. Nutrition epidemiology is people looking for associations between how we eat and whether or not we're healthy. And the way they do that is rather than measure what we eat um, or, or document or record uh, any data about what we eat, is they give us questionnaires. <laughs> They have thousands and thousands of people, food questionnaires, they're called food frequency questionnaires, and they administer them um, usually just once, twice, three times over a very, very long period of time to try to get a sense of what people are eating. And the, these questionnaires are extraordinarily limited in terms of their scope. You know, they can't capture the degree of complexity that exists in modern diets. And the types of questions they ask are really they're ludicrous. You know, uh, how many servings of blueberries did you have over the past year? I mean, how many people can, can reliably answer questions like that? And and, they, and you're forced to quantify your answer. You're not allowed, until very recently, I've, I've, I've lately come across a few studies where they do this, but for decades, you were not allowed to say, I don't know, or I, I'm not sure, I don't remember. Um, you were forced to pick a quantity. And that, that, that's the data upon which these studies were based. So they're not scientific. And most people cannot remember what they ate you know, a week ago, let alone a year ago. So these are not scientific studies. And the associations, furthermore, the associations that they find between what, let's say they're looking for an association between how much red meat you ate in a year and whether or not you're gonna get colon cancer, the associations are so tiny that um, professional epidemiologists 
um, would, would, would discount them as meaningless. So you don't see strong associations in nutrition epidemiology. You don't see them. There's a strong association needs to be at least, you need to see at least twice the risk of a particular condition occurring in a population um, with exposure to a particular issue. Like for example, people who say they eat red meat every day uh, versus people who don't eat red meat at all, they should have at least twice the risk of colon cancer. If you're, if you're going to try to pin the tail on the red meat donkey, that's what you're going to have to do. But these associations are well below uh, uh, two times. They're usually more like 1.1 or 1.2. They're, they're way below two. So these are supposed to be dismissed and they are taken seriously by reputable journals, by scientists, by nutrition policy makers. Uh, uh, it, it's just, it's, it's really, it's hard to, it's, it's really hard to understand how these types of studies are still being taken seriously by, by anyone. Um, and the problem with these studies is that they are, they're extraordinarily influential and they make for fantastic headlines. You know, things like, you know, eating two squares of chocolate, you know, twice a week, you know, will prevent Alzheimer's, you know, those, those kinds of things. And uh, so people love these studies. I think they kind of eat them up. And we want to believe that if we just eat more blueberries or eat more oatmeal or eat more chocolate or drink more red wine, who doesn't want to be told that if you just have a little bit more red wine or chocolate or, or blueberries, that you're going to be healthier. It's, there's, it's just not true. So most of nutrition science is based on this unscientific methodology, and that's how we've gotten into so much trouble. Yeah, the, 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 the anyone who's, anyone who's, who's really thought about it, I think comes to the same conclusion. Yeah. It's maybe a little disturbing and a lot of people don't want to go there, but um, I think once you, once you sort of go through the looking glass, then um, it's hard to unsee it. And it kind of plays into this um, psychology of wanting to add something rather than take it away. And that's something that, um, that you've spoken about as well that was very powerful for me in, in diagnosisdiet.com uh, around elimination diets. You know, the logic was uh, unassailable to me that if you're going to find out if there's something that you can't eat without a negative response, then if you suspect more than one potential trigger, you have to remove them all for a sustained period of time and have a good result and find a, a baseline of maximum health uh, from diet change and then introduce potential triggers to see if there's any uh, response, but do it one by one. And you know, even you're, what you're what you're just describing, Ali, that's an experiment, right? So you're doing an, an individual experiment. And epidemiolo nutrition epidemiologists do not do experiments. They do not conduct experiments to find out whether or not their their hypotheses about foods and health are right or wrong. So the hypotheses get published, and they are published as they're interpreted. They're 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 internalized as fact, and and they're not tested. And so um, they're allowed to persist, you know, in our, in our, in our culture as scientific facts that have never been tested. And, and, the, and the few that have been tested, uh, they're largely found to be wrong. So what, you're, what you just described is more scientific than a nutrition epidemiology study. Yeah, that's one of the things that really appealed to me as well is um, I've always been kind of someone who goes out and finds the best information I think I can find if I get interested in something and I just pursue it down to, you know, I'm always asking why, 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 quite irritating that way to some people, I think. And, um, it, you know, that that's where it took me. It bottomed out around elimination diets and I thought, hmm, yeah. And I was reading the blog Hyperlipid at the time as well 
And so I considered a reasonable elimination diet to be eggs and ghee. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I've never felt like I had an issue with eggs. Some people do, and they can be quite bad. But um, I thought, I'll try that. And um, I also had a little bit of a little bit of cream and sweetener in there. But again, double cream is low in, uh, very low in lactose and, and milk protein. It's mainly just the fat. Um, so I thought if there is a confounding thing going on, then, um, you know, maybe that's an issue, but it's unlikely. And also, you've got to live your life. You know, you have to try something that you'll actually be able to <laughs> do as the experiment. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're not machines. And I felt better than I ever had in my entire life. Um, I had a similar experience to you where my seasonal depression just kind of wasn't there that time around, um, which was life-changing. Um, and I was able to add things in one by one and really, really see if if it made a difference. I, I'm thinking about, um, you know, you being a doctor and the, the old biblical phrase, you know, physician, heal thyself, which comes to mind around so many kind of low-carb advocates. Um because I'm struggling to think of any you know, low carb or keto medical professionals who have not themselves benefited from doing it. Mm. And I think that's very powerful because it means you can advocate from a position of um, experience. Um, but also, it could be said that or, I, it gives perspective on doctors who maybe aren't sympathetic to it. So, for example, my GP at the time who had referred me to a psychologist, who referred me to a psychiatrist. And I ended up with an ADHD diagnosis, although there was sort of depression and anxiety in the mix too. Um, when I told my GP that I'd fixed it with nutrition, she kind of nodded like she just wanted me to get out of the office. She was sort of like the whole thing had been a hoax or something. I could not believe her response. But my sense was that she ate how you described earlier, low fat, um, plenty of fiber. She was about to retire. She was probably about 60 and was really thin. Doesn't seem, didn't seem to have any health problems. Although I, did, I, I don't know, but that was my sense. And so do you think doctors or healthcare professionals or just your average person who doesn't have an acute problem struggles to get to where we are mentally? It's a good question. I mean, of course, everybody's different, but my I think the reason why, it, it feels to me that the reason why there's um, not a lot of engagement from most physicians around um, dietary interventions, it's partly that they're overwhelmed and busy and they don't really have the time you know, to, to think about it. It's partly because you know if you come in and say you're better, well that's great. That then they're done. They can move on to their next patient because you know the, the, there's no role for them, right? And 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 partly, and this is the, I mean for the most part I think it's um, that the people are really busy that they may not take, have the time to to learn and understand. Uh, they may just need to move on to their next patient. But the the other the piece that's harder to understand for me is the lack of curiosity. So like why would if someone, if I've been seeing somebody for five years and really struggling to help them find find the right medication for their ADHD, say, um, and they come in one day and they say, "You'll never guess what happened. I, I, my ADHD is gone. My ADHD is gone. I, I did it by changing my diet. I mean, I would be intensely curious to understand. Okay, how did you change your diet and?" Wow, that's really interesting. Because and, and the reason why I'd be curious is first of all, I'm a curious person, but um, but I had a lot of patients with ADHD and 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 some of them I don't know how to help. Some of them don't respond to medication, some of them don't want to take medication, some of them have terrible side effects from medication, and some of them only respond partly to medication. Wouldn't I want to know as a physician how to get better at doing my job? And so that's the lack of curiosity, I think. It, that's the thing that puzzles me the most. And uh, I mean, there, there are many other you know, factors that, that probably play, play into this. 
including uh, the fact that, you know, physicians are trained to do things that are, shall we say, um, more, more along the lines of, of what you think you have to go to medical school for, right? So to prescribe medications, to do procedures, things that, that people who don't go to medical school are not allowed to do in many cases. So it feel, if you're prescribing a medicine or if you're doing a procedure, you feel like a real doctor. If you're talking about food and lifestyle and things like that, that's couldn't, I mean, anybody can do that, right? So isn't that kind of a waste of our special talent and, uh, and all of those years of training and all of that money and all that time and energy that went into, um, in, into achieving this special, this special credential. And, and I understand that too. Um, but the, the really wonderful thing about nutrition science is it is fascinating and it is real science. And the, the more you dig into it, the more, the more difficult it becomes, you know, especially the bio, on the biochemistry level. I mean, I, I love biochemistry and I love learning how cells work and how they make energy and, you know, all the different mole, molecular, you know, ninja tricks that, that, that our cells have to go through to turn one molecule into a different kind of molecule. And I mean, all that's really fascinating to me. Uh, so I don't find it scientifically any less rigorous <laughs> than, than anything else in medicine. But uh, I think a lot of people, I think a lot of physicians aren't necessarily that interested. Um, and I, I mean, but uh, I think that that's really where the money is. That's where, that's where if you really want to help your patients improve their health rather than just kind of, you know, tamp their symptoms down a little bit until the next appointment, if you really want to improve their health, it has to, it, it has to be improved from the inside out. It's the only real way to do it. And it is harder. It takes more time. Uh, you might need to assemble a team of people to help you, coaches, dietitians, uh, et cetera. Um, but that's how your patients are going to get healthier. And that's going to prevent you from burning out in your chosen field um, because people are actually going to get better. We're just not even taught that that is something that we should expect. In most cases, most psychiatrists I know, and I count myself among them, we were seeing our practices fill up with patients who weren't getting better. And we would continue to see them. We would continue to write prescriptions, refills, provide support, but most people were not getting well enough to be able to stop coming. And so you just accumulate a list of people that you would see for, um, for what was called maintenance maintenance care. And uh, that's really frustrating for patients as well as for, for doctors. And I know you've said to me in the past, uh, it might have been during the during your course, that during your training, there was some emphasis on psychological treatment as much as pharmacological treatment. And I wonder if that prepared you better for looking at alternatives to treating a patient because instead of say treating um a lab result you're doing a more sort of gestalt thing where you're looking at the person and saying well okay a lab result's one thing but what else is going on here well a few things about that so um in psychiatry uh, most psychiatrists you know we, we don't have diagnostic laboratory tests in psychiatry. There isn't, isn't a test I can give you currently, a single test where I can I can say, oh, you have bipolar disorder. Oh, oh this blood test shows that you have schizophrenia. Oh, this blood test shows you have ADHD. Um, it really is, uh, psychiatry is really, uh, a lot of it is practicing in the dark by taking a history of symptoms, looking in the DSM, which is this diagnostic, diagnostic and statistical manual to see if your symptom list matches up with any of those symptom lists and to make a diagnosis. And I put the diagnosis in your chart. And then I try to, and, and the DSM doesn't even tell you what to do about these diagnoses, doesn't tell you what the treatment should be. And so then you turn to your, your list of medications and the different types of therapy that might be offered in your area by the therapist that you know, and you create a treatment plan based on guesswork. Okay, you're depressed. Hmm. 
if you're depressed, we, we, I think, you know, should, you should have some psychotherapy and I know a good therapist here and you should you know, go and see her or him. And uh, maybe we'll start with an antidepressant. As long as you don't have any manic symptoms in your history, let's start with an antidepressant, maybe a serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitor, maybe like citalopram or escitalopram or um, paroxetine or um, so it, it's trial and error. And so um, you would think that psychiatrists would be really hungry for new ways to approach things because I think most of us feel frustrated with the limitations of what you know what we can do in terms of our diagnostics as well as our treatment plans. Um, but the, the, the training program that uh, um, uh, the residency program that I attended, um, four, four year psychiatry residency in adult psychiatry uh, at Harvard's Cambridge Hospital, that particular Harvard program was known for um, really valuing psychotherapy as well, not just medications, but psychotherapy as well. And so most of the people in that program really also valued psychotherapy. And, and I, I value psychotherapy too. I, I still use it every day in my work. But what was really frustrating about learning to become a psychiatrist is that in that four years, we learned so little about the brain. We learned about medications. We learned about psychoanalysis. We learned about psychotherapy. Um, we learned about how to manage emergencies. We learned about how to hospitalize people. We, we learned a lot of really valuable things, but we learned almost nothing about the brain, the very organ that we were medicating and talking to and thinking about. And that was very frustrating for me because I am interested in science and biochemistry and that sort of thing. And I, I, I think I was expecting to learn more about the brain. And so, uh, and, and what's really interesting to me is that even other people who, who graduate from that same program um, are not, don't, don't seem to be particularly curious about, about this type of approach. Um, so I, I, I think that the, the psychiatry as a field is really limited and needs to grow and needs to bring itself into the, the modern of uh, the, the 21st century, meaning we need better diagnostic tools. We need to understand the brain better so we can, uh, this is the organ that we are treating. We need to understand it better. And um, uh, because there are, we now understand uh, so much more than we even did 10 years ago about the types of about the types of metabolic problems that can go on for the brain that can cause serious psychiatric symptoms. And if you understand metabolism and you have some metabolic strategies in your toolbox, you'll be much better able to help your patients. You and you can use these in combination with medications, if you like, with psychotherapy, if you like. Um, it doesn't have to be an either or either or um, uh, approach. Um, but I would love there to be more curiosity about um, how people are, how some people are getting so much better. Some people are going com completely into remission, such as yourself using dietary changes. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it piqued my curiosity for sure. Um, made me change career. So um, it's funny because obviously there's a, a special feel to psychiatry and there might be negative connotations in that I think the stigma around mental health partly comes from what you talk about, how there's not really silver bullet metabolites or measurements you can take for these types of illnesses and in a sense it leaves uh, a, a kind of spooky victorian feel to you know to the whole thing that you know the thought of um asylums and stuff like that we just in some sense we haven't gone past that um uh meditation on mental illness where but i think that it has more in common with 
other medical specialties, then it then it has differences because you could choose, um, you know, the several prominent low carb doctors who come from different specialisms, and they've found the same thing with their colleagues that it's quite hard to convert them, if you like, even though a win in the old paradigm is just so far behind a win in a healthy metabolism paradigm. But maybe you could say in your old practice what a typical win might look like and what the best win might look like. And then since using ketogenic therapies, what a typical win might look like and what the best win might look like. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, you know, I practiced purely conventional psychiatry for 10 years, medications and psychotherapy. And then um, for the past 10 years have been incorporating to a greater and greater extent and now only uh, now exclusively um, nutritional uh, approaches, uh, metabolic strategies. Cornerstone of my practice now is the ketogenic diet, but I use other types of dietary strategies as well. So um, practicing conventionally for all that time, um, the kind of what a win would look like back then would be somebody who had, for example, um, uh, uh, bipolar illness or, or a psychotic illness such as schizophrenia, who would be you know hospitalized repeatedly and unstable and unable to unable to continue in their in their job or unable to finish college. I, I specialized in college mental health for many years. Um, you know, really interfering with their with their ability to live their lives. Uh, a win used to be finding the right medication, finding the medication or, or combination of medications that would keep that person out of the hospital um, and able to function in their chosen path, whether it was school or home or work, whatever it was that they wanted to do. Which is not um, nothing. Which is something huge. I mean, that's a huge win if you can do that. There's, there's, It's really, really important to emphasize that those are real wins. I mean... I have seen medication save people's lives, change people's lives. Medications do certain ones used used judiciously. Um, they can be game changing for people. There's no question about it. Um, do they work as well as we wish they did? No. Do they work for as many people as we wish they did? No. Do they um, do they uh, are they as well tolerated as we hoped they were? Absolutely not. I mean, I think the biggest problem with medications is even when you get a win, uh, you have to pay a price for that win in many cases with metabolic side effects, often tremendous weight gain, um, uh, sometimes type two diabetes, sexual side effects, extremely common, uh, particularly on the antidepressants, um, lower energy or sometimes kind of a feeling of apathy or, or dulled emotions. Uh, many, many different types of prices you have to pay in addition to what we have in the United States as co-pays, you know, for, for medications, in addition to the financial cost, you have a quality of life cost to a lot of these medicines. And which is why so many people don't stay on them, even when they don't, uh, even when they are helpful. So a really important tool to have in the toolkit, but, you know, not as, not as effective um, or as palatable as we wish it were but still extremely important. What a win looks like in nutritional and metabolic psychiatry is a person coming in and saying, they've had depression, anxiety, what have you, um, whatever mood or psychotic disorder for decades, and them uh, 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 completing their nutrition transition, usually the types of, the types of um, really excellent results we see in most cases are with the ketogenic diet. Um, if there's success on a ketogenic diet, what you see is uh, remission. What you see is a person not just saying, oh, you know, my symptoms are better. I can function. I haven't been to the hospital for, I haven't had to go to the hospital for the past year. What you see is people saying, I feel better than I have ever felt. And so a, a, like a, a sense of well being that goes beyond the illness. The illness is, feels as though it's gone um, and uh, they're functioning and feeling better than they ever have. In some cases without any medication, either coming completely off medication they had been taking 
or not needing to start a medication in the first place. That's what a win looks like in nutritional metabolic psychiatry. And um, while it may seem easier at first, and it is, to, to take a pill or to prescribe, to, as a doctor to prescribe the medication and as a patient to take the medication, it's easier at first, but in the long run, it's much harder um, because you have to be constantly watching out for side effects, monitoring lab tests, looking for problems, um, you know, dealing with all the health, health issues, both emotional and physical health issues that can come along. So, but if, if a person is following a ketogenic diet and it's helped them, you may have made yourself obsolete. They may actually not need you anymore. Um, and, uh, or they may only need to come in to see you every so often to report how well things are going or to talk about adherence issues. Adherence issues are very, very, um, they're really, really central to all of this. Of course, it's much easier to keep taking a pill than to, than to follow a special diet, but it's like night and day. I mean, I, it feels completely different to me practicing this way. Um, and it feels completely different to the people that work with me because it's, it's an empowering, it's an empowering, um, strategy. It puts the control really in the hands of the person with the symptoms and uh, it's really, I mean, I can't do the diet for them. They have to do it. And when they do, um, they feel a sense of pride and accomplishment um, and empowerment that does not come from taking medication. I mean, that's kind of not quite night and day. Like you say, it's a huge win if you can stay out of hospital, finish your degree, function. But decades with a psychotic disorder that goes into remission i mean wow and presumably because uh the mainstream media i I don't like using that term you know uh say the newswire or reuters or whatever um or uh the lancet new england general medicine and so on who take the uh low-powered epidemiology at face value Presumably, they're falling over themselves to report these uh, cases of uh, remission of psychotic disorders. <laughs> well, not until, for some reason, the the bar is much higher. Uh, the uh, uh, the bar is much higher for nutrition interventions than it is for epidemiology um, uh, studies. Uh, I mean, it's just un. I mean, uh, for example. Uh, I, I co-authored a paper this past summer um, uh, documenting the work of my colleague, Dr. Albert Donat in Toulouse, France. He put 31 of his patients uh, on a ketogenic diet in a hospital setting, monitored them closely. And um, these were patients that in some cases he'd worked with for decades with serious mental illness, psychotic illnesses. So uh, 12 of them, I think, there, let's see, 31 patients, uh, uh, 12 had bipolar disorder, 10 had schizophrenia, six had major depression. And these were people who had responded very minimally to um, full, full scale conventional care, medications, psychotherapy, et cetera. And uh, he knew these patients very well. He, they volunteered uh, to try the, the diet because nothing else had really worked that well for them. And so um, uh, he was curious to see if it would help. And um, all of these patients improved, all of the ones that could stay on the diet. Well, only three of them couldn't stay on it long enough to be followed. But they, but these patients, um, every, everyone improved, both ment their mental health and physical health. And 43% of them achieved clinical remission from serious long-term mental health issues. And this was not a controlled study. It was a real experiment with real people with remarkable results was not a controlled study. And it was very difficult for us to get this paper published because there was no control group. And yet, if I questioned people, if I if, if I um, sent a questionnaire out, you know, three times over 30 years to people about, you know, how many blueberries they were eating and found a, a minuscule association between their blueberry intake and their, their cognitive health, I would be able to get that published, no questions asked. So it's just... The bar is higher. And so a lot of people think that we really need long, you know, long randomized controlled trials um, to, 
to really demonstrate the benefits of this type of intervention. And I agree that those are very important and need to be done. But in the meantime, can we pay attention? Can we pay attention to uh, these experiences that real people, real clinicians and real patients are having, um, both uh, uh, outside of kind of a study type environment uh, people are taking matters into their own hands, trying to improve their own health with these diets and reporting uh, in social media and other, and other outlets really good results. Isn't that worth paying attention to? And what would the harm be of, of helping to uh, inspire people to think about this very low risk, very high potential benefit uh, intervention? Yeah, it has to start somewhere, doesn't it? And um, I guess a control. The benefit of having a control in a study is that you hopefully control for things like physician and support quality, the 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 way the facility is set up, and the uh, drug or diets administered, so on and so forth. But in a sense, there's a pseudo control because these people were under the same, roughly the same care. Is that fair to say for years without? Um, the same kind of results. Yeah, you know, in most cases, the every well, every one of these patients had been hospitalized at least once, and some multiple times, either in this same facility under this same psychiatrist's care, or in a sister facility uh, in the region under the same same psychiatrist's care. So, they had already sort of had this intervention before just without the ketogenic diet. So the ketogenic diet was the only difference between this particular time they were hospitalized and previous hospitalizations. I realize that's not a real control. I, I understand that. But I think that that's the closest, the close, as close as you could get um, to, uh, to, to, to a control group um, in this particular type of a type of a study. And it really you know, Dr. Danan did not set out to do a, a study for publication. He set out to find out whether he could help his patients. He was simply curious about whether or not this intervention would help these patients that he cares very much about and has been working with for such a long time and couldn't think of anything else to try. And so in a sense, it's you know, well, why not, right? Why not try this intervention? Um, you know, what do you have to lose? They've they've exhausted all, all, all other options. So you might think, well, this is a last, sort of a last ditch strategy, sort of a, a last resort. But why not consider it as a first resort? Um, and, you know, it, it's a very low, th th these people tolerated the diet extremely well, psychiatrically and medically. Their mental health improved, but their their, their overall health improved, people lost weight, their fasting blood sugar went down, their triglycerides went down in some cases by more than 100 milligrams per deciliter or more. Um, you know, their liver function improved. I mean, just their blood pressure improved. Everything improved. Um, and uh, so, so why wouldn't you think of this as a first resort um, before you think about uh, uh, except in cases of emergencies, before you think about a medication, which and to my way of thinking is a much higher risk, much lower benefit uh, intervention in, in, in a lot of cases. So you can't, diet isn't, a dietary intervention isn't appropriate for all circumstances, you know, psychiatric emergencies, for example, um, and not everybody will be able to change their diet or will want to change their diet. There's still a role for medications. Nobody needs to worry that medications are going to go away. <laughs> um, but why not why not help people understand that this is something that's been possible for others and inspire them to think about what it might do for them or a family member? Mm. Absolutely. And it, it's funny thinking about how, you know, uh, we go from sort of personal epiphanies to thinking about how to generate data that will turn enough heads to um, get some real momentum going. Um, where where we think it can help, and I'm really interested in the thought of study design and, for example, Verta Health, who you know, are, um, with their app and coaching support and low carb or keto, um, are really kind of 
um, revolutionising the way type 2 diabetes is being treated. And they get attacked for providing coaching as if that is somehow a negative. But I think when it comes to something as intrinsically human, cultural, religious sometimes, um, et cetera, et cetera, like as food is, then the idea that you can just treat it like it's a, a binary thing that you're either are doing or are not doing is naive. The, the coaching is huge because, um, because changing behavior is really hard. Uh, and it takes practice and it takes encouragement and uh, support and ongoing education. I mean, if you've been eating a particular way for 40, 50 years, changing the way you eat, even if it helps you feel, even if it puts your illness into complete remission, that's a huge motivator. That's often not enough to continue on the diet because the world we live in, um, uh, the, the food environment that we live in is so different from the, from the way that you're trying to eat if you're trying to follow a ketogenic diet. It's extremely difficult. It's, it's, it's socially and psychologically challenging. And uh, I think that there's nothing, I think it's really important to acknowledge that yes, it's, it's harder to do this, but it's also better to do this. It's it, this type of an intervention, we now understand so much about how ketogenic diets work uh, on, on a biochemical level. It's, I like to describe it in the course, it's, it's a multi-purpose tool. You know, it, it, it corrects a wide variety of biochemical abnormalities, metabolic abnormalities in the brain, multiple different pathways are positively affected. Um, that's the opposite of how medication works. Medication is designed to try to change one small thing um, in that very complicated network uh, within the brain. And whether or not it actually does that successfully it's going to have ripple effects that are negative on the rest of the brain and, and, and body. It's going to negatively affect metabolism and it's going to have downstream effects on the rest of the brain that are not necessarily positive. So that's the opposite of how a ketogenic diet works. The ketogenic diet works, uh, works when it works, it improves multiple aspects of health as side effects. I'd say these are side benefits. So it really is a very different way of thinking about things. And you know, I, I, but, but in order to, in order to adhere to, to that really healthy way of eating, it, it's difficult in, in the environment that we live in where we're at, there are refined carbohydrates at around every corner and all kinds of social situations that, that put pressure on you to eat a different way. And some of these, um, some of these products for a lot of us are really addictive. And so, um, the issue of the issue of the addictive component. I mean, who would criticize a study that was trying to address addiction? Who would criticize that study for including a support element? I mean, I just, it doesn't make any sense. So of course there needs to be support. Um, and, and Verta Health, I mean, uh, really trailblazing uh, really has helped to generate the studies and the data needed to convince people that following a low carbohydrate diet, if, if you give people support, um, really helps improve their overall health and can put their type two diabetes into remission. And all of that, all of that data would not have been generated were it not for the late great Dr. Sarah Hallberg, one of my personal heroes, who you know, was, was reading about low carb diets and thought, well, this is supposed to help with diabetes. Maybe I'll try it with my patients and see if I can help my patients get better. Just like Dr. Danon did with his patients in Toulouse, Dr. Halbert said, hmm, I wonder if this could help my patients. Let me try it and see. And then when she did, she was noticing, you know, some laboratory change, some changes on their labs and thought, oh, you know, uh, their cholesterol in some cases seems to be going up. I, I, I better, I, I better consult with somebody about this. And she consulted with, um, um, you know, Dr. Stephen Finney and said, you have to help me. My patients are, their diabetes is all going to, into remission, but their cholesterol is going up. We, and, and, and he said, Dr. Halberg, would you like to do a study? And that's how it all began. And this is, you know, it has to start, like you said, it has to start somewhere. And where it has to start, in two places, clinician curiosity and, 
and, and, and, and, and patient demand. <laughs> so, um, but, and now with social media, these ideas spread so much more easily. Information spreads so much more easily. People can, can access information they can use to help themselves improve their own health. Um, in some cases, you are going to need clinician, professional clinician support, and we can talk about that if you want. But uh, in a lot of cases, people follow these diets on their own. Um, uh, they read enough about them and learn enough about them to safely adopt these strategies on their own to see what is possible for them personally. They may need to wait 10 or 20 years for the particular randomized controlled trial of their particular condition to come out showing whether or not it works for what percent of patients, how is that gonna help that person right now? That person right now, all they need to know is whether the diet's going to help them. And the randomized controlled trial is not even gonna necessarily tell them that. In so many cases, the randomized controlled trials, they have to be so careful in who they pick to participate in their studies that they have to rule out a lot of patients, patients with messier diagnoses, you know, people who have not just clear-cut depression or clear-cut bipolar disorder, <laughs> clear-cut X, Y, Z, those people are often excluded from studies because it makes the study messier. And that's one of the things I loved about Dr. Danan's work. He had 31 volunteers, very complicated patients. Most or all of these patients had more than one diagnosis. None of these patients fit neatly into, into any category. These are people with long, you know, serious chronic mental illnesses. Many of them had you know, substance abuse as well, um, multiple psychiatric diagnoses. That's the way it is in the real world. So what you need to know, you person out there thinking about this for yourself, will this help you? There's only one person who can find that out for you and that's you. And so um, unfortunately, I think a lot of clinicians are very conservative in their thinking. And I understand that comes from a good place. You don't want to do harm. You don't want to, you don't want to you know, cause problems for a patient. Um, but, you know, I think that the, we need to, the conservative thinking I think can get in the way sometimes, because if you have your bar set so high that you're waiting for, you know, a multi-site randomized controlled trial with hundreds of patients in it that have the particular diagnosis that you are trying to treat in that one patient that just walked into your office, you know, you're waiting a really long time but, you know, so I, I think that, that 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 sets the bar pretty high, but that is where some people put it. I, I definitely have my bar in a much lower place. I, I think it's, I'm very, very comfortable. I feel very safe uh, and really comfortable using the strategy in my work. I know what to watch out for. I know what the, you know, uh, how to keep people safe while I'm doing this. Um, but I, I, I feel, I definitely feel as though I'm one of, you know, the small but growing group of um early adopters, or I call it early adopters of the science of hope. There's a lot of science here, a hundred years worth of science telling us that ketogenic diets stabilize brain chemistry, improve brain metabolism, and uh, and growing numbers of studies in the psychiatric literature as well. So um, yeah, I think that it would be really a good idea for us to become more curious and with patients who are interested in doing it, if they want to do it, why would you want, why wouldn't you want to help them? Wouldn't you want to help them try this to see if they could actually get better? Um, I think that would be a wonderful opportunity. Absolutely. So many interesting points raised. You know, I think about um, your distinction of, between uh, the way drugs work on usually a single pathway versus how uh, ketogenic diets, um, certainly metabolically uh, healthy diets and healing diets work on a number of pathways. Um, and, you know, when, you, when you're diving into sort of evolutionary mechanisms and biology and all the rest of it, you find that it's a bit like a soap opera, isn't it? You get this cast of characters and they crop up here, there and everywhere. There's this remarkable ability if you have an organism whose biology evolves over millions and sometimes billions of years where one molecule might do 10 different things. Sometimes they're the hero, sometimes they're the villain. 
And if you have a an intervention which um, does something positive on, say, five to ten very important pathways in a very profound way, it kind of indicates that you're acting on a major upstream cause of what was going wrong in the first place, as opposed to, say, suggesting that any individual has evolved a citalopram deficiency <laughs> right. over millions of years. It just doesn't stack up in that way. To me, that's one of the most powerful rationales of a ketogenic diet is those pathways all improving. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, in four years of psychiatry residency, you know, we talked a lot about medications and, you know, um, for example, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, like, like citalopram. Um, we talked a lot about kind of the minutiae about how they work, you know, how they work, work in the synapse and they help hold the serotonin in the synapse longer so that it can, uh, it can, it can send its signal for a little bit more time before it's recycled, kind of vacuumed back up into the, into the neuron that secreted it. So we, we talked a lot about that, but we never talked about what was, if, if this was even the case, if there really was a serotonin deficiency, what's causing it in the first place? And, and so many of these uh, psychiatric conditions, we were just, we thought of them as mysterious and chronic and incurable. And, um, and it just, it felt impossible to get to the bottom of these things. So we didn't even try when, from, from a biochemistry standpoint, from a, interestingly, from a psychoanalytic standpoint, we spent a lot of time trying to dig into the, like what, what the root causes were of somebody's psychological stresses. Was it, you know, their mother, was it, you know, some trauma in their childhood, you know, um, uh, some, you know, a, a lot of time and energy thinking about the root causes of their psych psychological issues, but we spent no time talking about the root causes of their biological issues. It, it just felt, it felt impossible to even think about. We didn't even ask the question. So when you ask that question, you get some really interesting answers and there are actually answers out there that very intelligent people are putting together, one of whom um, you know, is, is, is Dr. Ian Campbell, someone we, we both know and admire and respect, who put his own bipolar disorder into remission on a ketogenic diet. And he's a researcher at the University of Edinburgh. And he's um, written a number of brilliant papers on this is, if you look at the metabolism uh, of how, you know, how the brain is making energy in bipolar disorder, it's faulty in a lot of people there's difficulty burn, turning glucose into energy. And so how a ketogenic diet might work to help that person is when you are burning ketones, more ketones and less glucose, because you're always burning some glucose, but if you're burning more, more ketones, more fat uh, and less, less glucose, less sugar for energy, if your brain kind of shifts into a lower glucose state of mind, you're bypassing partially a lot of that, those glucose mechanics. So if there's, if there, are, if there are defects there, if there are any defects in the glucose pathways, you can skirt around them using a ketogenic diet, either partially or fully, depending on where the defect is. And that re-energizes those cells, which prior to that would have been sputtering along, not getting enough energy. And if your brain cells don't have enough energy, then any number of things can go wrong. So um, it's really, um, if you ask the right questions, you can actually find answers. Um, but we as a field have not been asking these questions until very recently. Yeah, it's, a bit, it's, it's very revealing and a bit sad in a way. You know, sometimes when friends go and see about medical conditions, I'll withhold mainly from evangelizing, but I will tend to ask people, you know, how was the doctor's root cause analysis? And usually they kind of think, <laughs> God, I didn't, I didn't ask at all or think at all about why it might, why I might have this. It's quite, it's quite disturbing. And you know, the points you're making, kind of, make me want to fuse a couple of uh, questions that I had, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, yourself and a couple of others of a couple of other um psychiatrists who are kind of into metabolism have said that and, and this is 
broadly true for epilepsy, I think, as well with ketogenic diets, is that maybe a third, roughly, but I'm not sort of pinning anyone down on numbers here, but a third, roughly, of people do really well on them. Maybe a third notice something positive, but it's not like a silver bullet. And then a third don't really notice much at all, or it gets a bit worse or, or something. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the you spoke about how impaired glucose metabolism can um, mean that you you just stop being able to use glucose properly. So you being able to use ketones in the brain through a ketogenic diet is potentially one one way of um of getting better. But people can be a little bit broken in different ways. You know, there can be um, developmental issues which are essentially, you know, irreversible. Um, although you can ameliorate them sometimes, there can be damage which takes a long time to recover from. Um, and there can be different types of damage so that, you know, I know we've spoken before about trauma and it's dead clear from the literature, I think, that adverse childhood events do impair your mental health into the long term. So I guess, you know, what do you think the best... Um, hope is in that regard for the third of people who it doesn't seem to help at the moment um and and maybe you could address the trauma question particularly because i know that a lot of people come back at me with that kind of thing you know you can't eat your way out of uh having had a rubbish childhood you know oh my goodness of course you can't you can't go back and change the past um and but that shouldn't mean that you shouldn't try to improve your overall brain health anyway and because if you do, uh, if you do understand how to eat, whether it's a ketogenic diet or not, there are certain dietary principles which are really important to follow, whether you're going to eat a ketogenic diet or not. And most people are not following those. So because we have the wrong information about about what a healthy diet is, and particularly about what a brain healthy diet is. So, um, so the first thing is, why wouldn't you want to take care of your brain anyway? Why wouldn't you want to improve the overall health of the brain anyway? Um, for all kinds of other reasons, but of course we can't go back and, and, and change the past. And people have, have, I mean, very, very real, uh, traumas in their past, terrible childhood experiences, physical trauma, sexual trauma, military trauma, um, all kinds of, uh, and even nutritional, uh, deficits early in life that, that impair brain development and, and make it impossible, you know, for the brain to develop properly. There are many different kinds of, of issues that we can't go back in time and correct. Um, but my experience working with patients, because many, many patients um, that I've worked with uh, over my more than 20 years of a, as a psychiatrist now, many of my patients have had adverse childhood experiences and adverse adult experiences as well. And um, what you notice is that if you improve the health of the brain using dietary strategies, it's not that those experiences no longer affect the person or that it feels as though they hadn't ever occurred. It's that in many cases, not all, there are exceptions where it doesn't seem to make any difference at all. In most cases, what I see is people responding to those experiences differently, thinking about them differently, um, and uh, being able to cope with them in a different way and view them in different light. It's really interesting what happens. So people, for example, will say, you know, it's no longer right here. It's no longer right in front of me every day. I can push it off to the side, or I can put it in context, or I can, I can step back from it and think about it in a new way and imagine different solutions, uh, different ways of getting through my day. I can think about other things. And I, I think this is really remarkable. And the, the other thing about a, a ketogenic diet is that if you stay on it for long enough, assuming it's helping you, if you stay on it for long enough, there's a certain degree of healing that can take place. Even if there has, if there has been, you know, for example, a certain amount of physical trauma um, or even a very serious neurological condition such as epilepsy. We know from the epilepsy literature that especially in younger people, children in particular, with terrible seizures that wouldn't respond to medication trials, 
on a ketogenic diet, they would follow the diet for a couple of years, maybe two, three, four years, five years. And in, 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 in some cases, in as little as two years, after they could go off the diet and remain seizure-free. And what that tells us is that there's healing going on. And you don't know how much healing is possible for you unless you try. And so I, th I think adopting that stance of hope and possibility is really important because we don't know what's possible for you unless you try. But I can tell you that most of my patients with trauma feel differently about that trauma when their brain is healthier. And I, I can't say anything, I can't guarantee you anything more than that. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, and change what happened for everybody I've worked with who's been through uh, these things. Um, I, I always, before I, before I had nutrition in my toolbox, I used to say to people all the time, I, I, I wish I had a magic wand. I wish I could make this go away and I can't make it go away, but maybe, maybe if you were healthier through like from within, maybe if your brain and body were healthier, you might feel better despite this trauma in certain ways that might surprise you that you might not have thought was possible before. Yeah. Until someone feels that new way, you can't describe it. It's not yeah. a, it's not a words thing. Is it? It's an experiential thing, which is just a different category of phenomenon. Uh, you can say you will, you, you might feel a lot better, but until people feel it, they won't know that that level exists. <laughs> I really like the way you said that because it is more like more like um, music than lyrics. You know, mm. it's it's an emotional experience, and because everybody's so unique, everybody's different. I can't tell you how you're going to feel. Um, uh, you have to try it and see, and then you come and tell me. You know, and and even then, it's hard to describe. It. Like you're saying, it's a, it's a, it's a different state of mind, and different state of heart in a certain way. Um, and, and unless people try and see what's possible for themselves, we just can't predict, um, to what extent they may feel better or in what ways. And that's, that's both the frustrating nature of it, but it's also the beauty of it. But I would say this, the very same thing is true about medications. You know, I prescribe medications. I still do. I mean, prescribe medications for more than 20 years. I could never tell anybody what that medication was going to do for them or against them until they tried it, even though we had lots and lots of studies published, randomized control trials and all that about these medicines, I could never tell anybody what they could expect from that medicine. I could say, well, most people or some people or this or that, but you know, they could come in three weeks later and have sprouted horns. <laughs> and even if that hadn't happened, and, and I, you know, they would tell me about some side effect that they'd gotten from this medication that I'd never seen in any study. And I would say to them, well, I believe you, because nobody's ever tested this medicine out on you before. You're the first one to try it out on yourself. And so we're, people don't, I know people are uncomfortable with uncertainty, but there's just as much uncertainty with medications as there is with diet. And, and per, perhaps even more uncertainty with medications in a certain way, because medications are designed to interfere with your healthy chemistry. That's what they're designed to do. The ketogenic diet is, is what it does is it improves, uh, supports healthy metabolic, healthy health, general health and metabolic health, which are essentially one and the same. So I know that you're going to get things are certain things are going to get better. I just don't know which things necessarily or to what degree. Um, but I feel much more confident in prescribing this particular strategy uh, uh, as I as I did prescribing medications. And you know. Anybody out there who's ever prescribed medications or gone through lots of different medication trials, it can take years sometimes to find the right medication or the right combination of medication or the right dosages um, that feel like they're worth taking that improve the quality of your life without too many side effects. That can some, in, I mean, in most cases, it was less than a year that it would take us um, working closely together, but in some cases, it would take several years. Um, the nice thing about a ketogenic diet is within three months, you've got a really good sense of what's possible for you. Um, sometimes you'll even notice benefits within a few days to a few weeks. So, um, that to me is a great investment in your future. Um, and well, well worth, well worth trying And in, in there. They're definitely, it's not for everybody. 
there are some people who should not do this. And there are some people who need special support, professional support to do this. But it is uh, the reason why I'm so excited about it and why I love to, to speak about it and share about it is because it is the most powerful and most hopeful uh, intervention that I've ever used in my, in my uh, career. To torture the music metaphor a bit further, <laughs> um, you know, maybe when when I copied what Peter from Hyperlipid was doing with the sort of uh, ghee egg yolk um, sort of uh, keto ice cream route that made me feel amazing. I was kind of playing three blind mice on the piano and I thought wow I'm really carrying a tune here and then I definitely have hit lots of bum notes over the course of a few years where I kept my, you know my bent noir is probably dairy I kept going back to it and um I have lots of issues with it and you know when I've as as um, metabolic dietary strategies for mental health has become more credible especially with people like yourself people like uh, Rachel Brown Chris Palmer Ian Campbell um and others um and studies in very respected institutions taking place so on some people have said instead of just ignoring me they've, they've responded and said you know um it didn't work for me unfortunately you know and I guess some people start and just get bum notes straight away. I I got lucky in a sense that I played three blind mice and thought, wow, I'm I'm doing really well here. So that experience, that musical experience, can be can be negative, even if some people might ultimately find that they're you know feeling like a Mozart symphony. So you know you spoke about in your in your course. Um, certain sort of headlines to do with that around how long you need to give it to see if it's working for you and common pitfalls i wonder if you could talk about a couple of them just so that people can be like oh well maybe that maybe that's what went wrong for me absolutely so uh in in my practice what a lot of people consult with me because they've tried a ketogenic diet and it they it hasn't worked for them or it's made them feel worse and so they're they're looking for guidance about well you know, could they, could they do it differently? You know, what, what went wrong? And so in most cases, uh, now certainly in some cases, it's that the ketogenic diet just wasn't going to work for them because it doesn't work for everybody. It does help most people uh, improve to some noticeable extent and, and quite a few people to a really significant extent. But there are some people I can probably count on one hand out of the hundreds of people I've worked with people who haven't responded at all to this diet, no matter what we do. Um, so of course it doesn't help everybody, but um, when I'm consulting with people who say it didn't work or it made them feel worse, in most cases, it's either because they didn't try it for long enough or they didn't try it correctly, meaning they weren't in uh, consistent uh, or consistent ketosis uh, for long enough. So what I tell people is if you haven't tried being in ketosis, you know, having a decent, decent uh, ketones on your ketone meter, at least 1.0 millimole. Um, I like to ask people to, to try to get above 1.0 millimole. Um, everybody's got a different kind of therapeutic win therapeutic range. Some people feel better, a little higher, a little lower, but to be in ketosis um, almost all the time, almost every day for six weeks. If you've done that and you still haven't felt better, then maybe it's not going to work for you. But if you, if you haven't tried that, then you haven't tried it yet because so many people will go on a low carb diet and they won't measure their ketones. They won't realize they're not in ketosis or they're only in ketosis sporadically. And that doesn't allow your metabolism to shift gears. It really takes about three weeks for uh, the inner workings of your cells to to adapt, uh, to, to begin to adapt to this diet and start changing the way they're doing things. So that it's really important to try it 
to be in ketosis, to give yourselves those signals that, okay, we're going to do things differently from now on. We're not going to go back and forth between carbohydrates and fat. We're not going to do mostly carbohydrates all the time. We're not going to do ketones one day and carbohydrates for three days. Things are going to be different around here. I'm not going to feed you those carbohydrates. You're going to have to burn fat <laughs> and um, uh, you're going to have to start burning the, the fat either from food or from your body fat. And we're going to have to start getting good at using uh, that fat to supplement the, the glucose. That takes a little time. So if you haven't been in ketosis uh, for six weeks, you haven't tried it yet. And there are lots of other troubleshooting strategies I work on with people, but that's really the most important thing. That makes sense. And I think people, especially people coming from, you know, not particularly scientific background, um, that side of things is a bit scary. And I think a little bit of uh, just encouragement that it takes a wee bit of time is sometimes all people need. Um, you know, my friend, for example, who's a chef, he tried it and felt weaker for some time, a couple of months mm -hmm. maybe, he can cycle as well for two or three months, and then he noticed that he was he, he he was cycling as fast as he used to be able to, just as his metabolism came up to speed. Um, there's all sorts of instances like that, whether it's feeling mentally sluggish or physically sluggish. What's the difference? Um, you know, this, I quote you all the time, and I, I can't remember if I'm paraphrasing or I get the quote right, but studies have shown conclusively that the um, the <laughs> the brain is, in fact, part of the body. Part of the body. <laughs> it's so funny, you know. We 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 kind of think everything kind of stops here. Um, <laughs> that if you know if you if you're if you're not physically healthy, I mean, I hear I hear this all the time that people will say, like for example. Um, you know, say an older individual will bring in their, their spouse and they'll say, um, you know, he, he's really not, he's, he's really not able to remember things the way he used to be. Um, you know, he's just not the same as his, his mood isn't good. Um, and, and they say, I, I don't really understand why this is happening. He's so healthy. And, um, if your brain isn't working properly, then you're, you're not healthy. And there are all of these silent, silent illnesses, silent metabolic conditions that kind of eat away at our good health over, over long, long periods of time that unfortunately most, most physicians and other types of healthcare practitioners still aren't trained to look for these things. They're only trained to look for the end stage result of these problems like diabetes, type two diabetes and Alzheimer's disease, heart disease. Once, once, you know, once the, the once the person has already developed these very serious conditions, but these conditions are developing silently in the background over long, long periods of time. And we can detect the, you know, the, the signs of these uh, very, very early on, if we know what to look for. So yes, it's all connected. If you're, if you're, if you're, if your body isn't healthy, your brain won't be and, and vice versa. So, um, all this, all of your cells need the same basic nutritional care, and they're all using the same, the, the same uh, raw materials to to function. And if they're malfunctioning in one place, uh, you can you can be reasonably ass assured that cells in the rest of your body are struggling as well. I think really the biggest difference between why some one person might develop Alzheimer's and another person might develop type two diabetes and another person might develop heart disease or obesity or fatty liver or what have you is uh, that's where the genetics come in. Like, what are you most vulnerable to? What's going to go wrong in you if you don't eat properly? You, you look at your family and uh, that's going to give you a lot of information about what you're most vulnerable to developing if you eat the wrong way. But some of the similar, some of the same processes are happening on a cellular level to, to, to lead to those diseases. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's really important that we start to think about mental illnesses as physical illnesses because they are, and we have to even begin to think about psychiatric illnesses as neurological illnesses because they are, I mean, the brain is made of neurons <laughs> and uh, it doesn't make sense. The other thing I really like to say <laughs> is, you know, it doesn't make sense to divide the brain into psychiatry cells and, and neurology cells. It's one organ 
Uh, and it's just that it can, if something goes wrong with it, you can have different types of symptoms. This type of symptom is going to be treated by a psychiatrist. This type of symptom is going to be treated by a neurologist, but it's all brain. It's all about brain health. So, um, yeah, I think it's time for us to integrate the head into the rest of the body. Yeah, I agree completely. I, I, I feel like uh, I could keep talking for some time, but um, I think that's a, a really positive way to end it and whet people's appetite for um, listening to more of your talks and, um, you know, anticipating the book coming out next year, I think. Is that right? Yeah, so I'm writing a book uh, called Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, and it will it will touch on all of these things we've talked about. So um, really, the the, uh, the book is, is in four parts, and the first part is um, introducing this concept of um, the metabolic underpinnings of, of psychiatric conditions from very mild conditions to, to very serious. And, and then kind of take apart some of that nutrition science that we were talking about. So you can kind of start with a clean slate. So you don't have uh, these um, misconceptions about nutrition in your mind. So you have to start from a clean slate and then um, kind of diving into the brain a little bit, like what is it made of? What does it need to work properly? And, and, uh, and, and how does the brain make energy? So brain metabolism. So all of that will kind of lay the foundation. Okay, here's going to clean the slate. We're going to look at what the brain actually needs. We're going to figure out what the brain wants to eat by looking at what it's made of. And then the second part of the book is all about food. So which foods are going to safely deliver those nutrients and building blocks and fuel sources, which of those foods are going to do the best job at delivering to your brain what it needs. We're going to go through, we're going through everything. So meat and grains and dairy and eggs and vegetables and fruits, all the food groups. And then the second part of the book is really addressing specific kinds of uh, mental health conditions, um, kind of what, how it is that your diet can, can uh, contribute, how poor diet can contribute to those mental health problems and how eating a proper diet can, can uh, resolve or uh, help you address a lot of those mental health problems, and including three different dietary strategies uh, in the fourth part of the book with meal plans and recipes. Patricia Daly is, has, has created those for us. And um, so there'll be kind of a kind of a lower carbohydrate, kind of a moderate carbohydrate paleo diet. There'll be a ketogenic diet and there'll be a carnivore diet plan as well. So for, for people to choose from, and these are uniquely modified plans that have that where I've removed some of the foods that are more common culprits in um, people with food sensitivities or gut issues or um, uh, neurological sensitivities. So it's kind of a special, there'll be special food lists involved, but, um, that way people can kind of enter where they feel most comfortable. You don't have to do a ketogenic diet. If you just want to experiment with improving the quality of your diet without being ketogenic, you can do that. Um, and so, because for some people, a ketogenic diet is a non-starter. And, but there's so much people can do, even if they don't want, even if you, the idea of reducing your carbohydrate intake to say 20 grams or so per day is not your cup of tea. There's still a lot you can do to improve um, your physical and mental health, um, even without doing a ketogenic diet. So I just want to, I, I kind of wanted there to be room for everybody at the table, so to speak. Wow. It sounds like a, a, a really fascinating and comprehensive take on it I, I'm I, I can't wait to read it <laughs> well I, I I am looking forward to 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 uh, sharing it with everybody when it's ready <laughs> and people can still find your um your blog and other resources and uh, if there's any clinicians who are interested or health coaches interested um information about your your course that you run on diagnosisdiet.com is that right Yep, yeah, that's right. Uh, on a diagnosis diet, there's a training tab. And if you click on the training tab, it'll explain, you know, how, uh, how the training works and has all the information there. And you can contact me through that page if you have questions about it. And the next trainings are are getting underway in January. I believe it's January. So well, it, it depends on the day. So so the first week of January is when the next trainings are beginning. If anybody's interested, please let me know. And you've also got some really cool um, articles that have done really well on psychology today. Is that right? 
Yeah, so um, I've written many articles for Psychology Today. They're all free for people to read. Um, so there are articles there about Alzheimer's prevention, about um, paleo diets and mental health, about why the brain needs animal fat, um, lot, ketogenic diets um, and mental health, lots and lots of different articles there. Most of them are pretty short and all of them are free to read. So if you just you know, Google my name, my last name is E-D-E. If you Google my name, in psychology today, you'll come up with a list of articles in, in case any of those topics interest you. And you're quite active on Twitter as well, aren't you, at Georgia EMD? Yep, that's the that's the platform where I'm most active. I, I have Facebook and LinkedIn accounts, but I, I, I don't use them as often. I am most active on Twitter. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much again for, for coming on. Um, you know, it's it's been brilliant to get to know you doing your course um, and it's been very useful to do your course. And of course, it's been very useful to me personally to read your stuff early doors six and a half years ago. Um, so thanks for that. And um, is there anything else you wanted to say? Uh, I just really appreciate you inviting me on, Ali, and it was it was great having you in the course. And I, I think, uh, you know, uh, it was a really good experience. The group that you were in, um, there was just a special chemistry and people really got along really well. And that's one of the things about the course that I love is the, the small group, uh, 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 the small group atmosphere where we can ask questions and share and learn from each other. Um, uh, that that's really kind of a special, a special um aspect of the course that I happen to enjoy. So and it was really great having your insights and your contributions and sharing your experiences with the rest of the class. I think it, it really added so much to the to to the um to the feel of that group. So thank you very much. Oh you're welcome. Thanks. That's kind. Well um I look forward to reading the book and I look forward to getting the podcast out. And thanks again, Georgia. Thank you again. And so nice to talk with your listeners. I hope everybody is having a having a good day. Okay. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>